Hey, welcome back to the channel. And yet again, yes, another 1000 word story inspired by a piece of artwork written on the spot without an outline whatsoever. This is another sci-fi piece, but a very special sci-fi piece because it was um, inspired somewhat by the film Blade Runner from 1982. And that is because the artist was inspired by that film as well. And so needless to say, that inspiration was reflected back into the writing. So what did I listen to? Well, of course, the Blade Runner soundtrack by Vangelis. Rest in peace, my friend. It is a beautiful, interesting collection of soundscapes, both synthetic and almost kind of jazz-like, which is definitely another inspiration in the story, which you will find out very soon. So why don't you step through that gritty neon haze with me and let's check out this week's artwork. This week's artwork is titled Last Woman on Earth, and it's by Piotr Krinsky, who is an art director concept artist at One Pixel Brush in Dansk, Poland. This artwork, as noted by the artist, was inspired from 1982's Blade Runner. And it, I think it's pretty apparent when you look around the scene of crowded men. But let us take a closer look. So we have a woman lying on a surgical table. She has these crazy tubes coming out of her chest. And she indeed looks dead. And there's a man sitting next to her wearing these round glasses with, with this uh, bountiful mustache. And he's holding her hand, looking directly at us into the camera. But around him are all of these other men. They don't seem particularly distraught, with the exception of the one who's uh, leaning forward toward this man under the light. We have a guy moving through curtains in the background. Uh, everybody else just seems kind of respectful, I guess. There's even conversations happening off to the left side. So it's kind of tough to discern what the mood in this room is, with the exception of the man looking right at us. So I will most definitely take inspiration from uh, Blade Runner in this one. So, Piotr, thank you so much for this inspiring artwork. All right, let's see what I came up with. Soon the room full of men would know Leon was a liar. A voice beside him. Down two levels. Another. Won't work. Too far gone. Yet another. Bullshit. Adrian said. Shut up, Brent. Soon the room full of men would want answers. Meat locker curtains behind Leon brought the stink of plastic apt. The vital readouts composed of ever-changing numerical values opposite the surgical table and Clara's dead body mimicked the dawn of a dying sun as Leon's tinted spectacles slid to the end of his nose. He had to open his mouth to breathe. He tasted plastic. What did I tell you? It's time. Can't be. A stretch of silence then the digital clatter of numbers changing. Let me try. Ram, just don't, okay? Just don't. Another D99, you think? My jump start the... No, no, no. She's not gone. She's not... Dead. Clara wasn't. She stood across the dark ballroom in a gown the color of a neon evening. Behind a sheet of rain dyed the color of synthetic jazz. It's what played now. What played him to her. Her to him. Their bodies met on the vacant dance floor, connected, electric. He took her hand. She led him, then he let her lead. Sluicing through the dingy volumetric pillar, radiating from the ceiling, capturing their breath, the smoke drifting in from outside, the smell of the rain that was the color of her dress. She smelled real, was real. When are you going to trim that silly thing? She asked. He was too close, too soon, so he erected his posture. She looked into his eyes, and he into hers. They were striking. He looked for a flaw there, because she had to have flaws. Everyone did. He did. I'll tell you what, she said. Our time is running out here. We take a cab back to my place, and I clean that up for you. She sustained her last word, drawing her finger down the curl of his mustache and he swore he saw sparks. He smiled. The ends of his mustache were observers in the corner of his eyes. The music stopped. The light above dimmed while others in the darkness around the room swelled to illuminate the downcast expressions of men at tables nursing amber drinks. All eyes on them, on her. Blood filled Leon's face. We should go. She noticed the eyes and gave them what they wanted uncaring of the danger. 
She trilled the cord with parted lips and a tongue pressed behind her front teeth. They all leaned forward, as if one. Leon dragged her to the exit, which was blocked by a man the size of a door. He spoke on a stream of cigar smoke. ID, please. You let me in, Leon said. We were supposed to be alone. The darkness moved where the man's eyes should have been. Just started my shift. Leon rolled up his sleeve. Here. The man held a strobing purple light above the number on Leon's forearm. The lady? Leon waited for the scan to register, so he could blink, so he could think, so his blood would continue pumping oxygen through his system, so he wouldn't... Uh, Mr. Young, the man said. Forgive me, sir. I had no idea. Clearance five, understood. Please, sir, I hope you... Leon pushed past him, Clara in tow. You can't do that, he said to her. Do what? What you did back there. No harm. You don't understand. She wrapped herself around him. I do. He held her at arm's length. No, you don't. What her rain cloak didn't hide, his umbrella did. And what that didn't, the night would. You don't understand, she said. What it's like. If we were caught, then what? Would that be better? Than what we have? There is no we in this. There is me hidden away in an apartment, only able to come out at night like some freak. Do you think I'm a freak? A cab passed by in a spray of water. Leon turned his back to shield her. The water clung to his coat. No. Then why? She asked. They don't know. They can know. You did everything perfectly. Did I? She smiled and pushed back a clump of hair the rain had plastered to his forehead. You do everything perfectly. The ends of his mustaches sagged down the sides of his face. Except that. He looked into her eyes again for the flaw he knew was there. Because she was real. Then movement drew his gaze over her shoulder. The crowd of men from the bar that shouldn't have been there. A voice behind her. Hey! Another. Didn't you recognize us? Yet another. Wanted to be a surprise. The traffic, the rain, the buzz of neon turned their voices to static. He didn't recognize any of them. They had women on their arms as well. Those perfect eyes reflecting the night like a pack of wolves. They showed their teeth. Clara went to turn, but Leon held her face. Held her eyes with his gaze. There it was. Let me buy you a drink, you and the lady. After all, it's your... The man tripped and fell on the Clara, who pushed Leon to the ground, and she rolled over him onto the street, right into the high beams of an oncoming cab, her hand still in his. Clara lay on a surgical table, far from the drenched street, tubes coming out of her chest, tubes Leon had feigned to attach, to not alert the room full of men, who were his friends, who would turn him in if they knew. Her vitals would soon be meaningless and give him away. Her smell. But for now the air was heavy with the scent of plastic and condolences. As the room full of men treated this like any other android repair job, they argued about parts and procedures that would not save the last woman on earth while Leon held her cold hand. Welcome to the end reviewer. I am so glad you made it. This is where I talk about my final thoughts, what I liked, what I didn't like, Maybe what I learned. So hopefully uh, you got what I was going for here, right? We have clearly The Last Woman on Earth. That was the uh, title of this piece and definitely inspired where I wanted to take it. I did change it up about halfway through, though. Originally, I was going to have her be an android, but then I decided, well, I should probably use the title to my advantage and make her actually the last woman on earth. There's a couple of techniques that I, I toyed with here, I tried to utilize, so let's get into this. So I start off with what I would hope to be an interesting hook line. Soon the room full of men would know Leon was a liar. I think first lines are really important, uh, to me anyway, uh, and a lot of times they're in the omniscient voice because they allow you to tell something a little bit more mysterious, just like this one here. And because the way the artwork was set up, right, we have this guy looking at us, right? He's the one, he's Leon in this, which is obviously a name inspired from the film Blade Runner. 
And he's just surrounded by all these guys. They look like some of them are in conversation. They're observing him. They're observing this woman who he's holding the, the hand of. And so I just imagined just all of this cacophony of voices around him. And so that's what this was. So a voice beside him, down two levels, another, won't work, too far gone, yet another, shut up, Brent. So all of these guys are talking about him or about her actually about the situation that's at hand we don't really know though why right we have no idea at this point it's just like I, I wanted to try to capture the idea of a guy sitting there focused on everything except what was around him right except these guys around him and just voices coming in left and right like we're just stepping into this room for the first time and we have no idea what's going on and then i counter the first line with soon the room full of men would want answers. That was sort of a bookend, right? Uh, from the first line to this string of dialogue. And then um, also some, some imagery here of a meat locker curtains behind Leon. So those are the ones where the man's passing through in the artwork uh, brought the stink of plastic, apt. And I think the smell, so I talk about the smell of plastic a couple of times. And I think um, to me, it represents death, right? Because you see uh, these kind of curtains in, um, Meat lockers, obviously, slaughterhouses, right? And so it just sort of exudes that kind of sensory detail, I guess, the, the sterility or, or the antiseptic nature of uh, a slaughterhouse or, or a medical room or something like that. And so he himself even agrees apt. And so I, I start to establish that he's looking at some vital readouts. Um, this woman is on life support, presumably, something like that. And the voices come again just kind of clipped scattered lines of dialogue that really mean nothing to us and then it continues again and i start to just add in some weird terminology that doesn't matter because it's science fiction right and i do this a lot i enjoy this kind of stuff it's sort of a segue into a section so uh no 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 she's not gone she's not and then dead and this is when i begin the narrative this is when i jump back into the past uh naming this woman clara who is the woman who's lying on the table obviously and this is when I get a little bit uh, noir-ish, I think, with the writing. At least that was my intention anyway. Where I'm talking about she stood across the dark ballroom in a gown the color of a neon evening behind a sheet of rain dyed the color of synthetic jazz. So to me, that sounds pretty noir. Uh, it's what played now, what played him to her, hurt him. And honestly, this entire section was inspired by the soundtrack. So I was listening to the Blade Runner 1980, 1982 soundtrack and uh, this kind of music popped in, right? It sounded like a uh, ballroom kind of music, or at least a dance floor kind of music to some degree. And so that is why I said it here. That's really the only reason. Um, and, and that's what I do. I love, right? I, I love about listening to music. If you're not listening to music while you write, uh, highly just give it a try, right? Even if it starts to bother you right off the bat, obviously no lyrics, but I would just give it a try because it really kind of sets the tone. Um, I don't think it needs to be as specific where you're trying to uh, create songs per scenes or anything like that. I, I just kind of let it flow and get into my subconscious and hopefully something happens. It's ex it's especially helpful with these short stories because um, again, there's no outline. Um, hopefully I, I'm getting inspiration from all kinds of different different areas. But anyway, they're dancing and I, so I had to go back. When I went back and edited this, uh, when I first had her be, she was an Android, right? I was thinking, okay, well, uh, you know, having an, an Android woman is, is maybe against the law or something. That's what I was talking about. Uh, you know, they're going to think he's a liar. They're going to want answers like what the hell's going on. And then I changed her to be real. And so that's why I started adding things like this in here. And I'm not sure if it was super clear. Again, that's the one challenge with uh, sort of teasing out a mystery is, is what is too much and what is not enough, uh, especially with the constraints of a thousand words. It can be kind of a challenge, but that's what I was trying to do here. She smelled real, was real. And he's also looking for a flaw, right? So right here, she looked into his eyes and he into hers, they were striking. He looked for a flaw there. And so the flaw being she is human. She is real. She is not perfect. And that is, or, and that is countered by when um, all of his buddies, right, who were there to surprise him at this club, um, have all of their android women with them, right? They have these pure white eyes. They have these, these, these white teeth and, and very, very fake. And then with some of the dialogue, I get into like our time is running out here. Come back to, let's go back to my place. And she's kind of making fun of his mustache because... You know, he is the man sitting, holding your hand. That's what that attribute is for. 
And um, finally, we see all these guys sitting around, and he freaks out. What's going on? The reader doesn't know what's going on, right? Uh, and so, hopefully, that that kind of writing is is somewhat compelling, right? It, it hooks you. Like, I want to I want to see this through. I want to see what it is. And while I don't think it's warranted all of the time, I think definitely in situations like these, it's 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 worth a try anyway. So he gets stopped at the door with this man asking for an ID, and you know he scans his arm. He's got some kind of barcode there. Um, and then you know the guy recognized him, Mr. Young. This is actually inspired by Sean Young, who played um, Rachel in the original Blade Runner. So I do that a lot. I like to give uh, names or, or hints of names uh, of, to, to the characters of the properties that inspired me when I was writing stuff. I think it's, it's fun because sometimes uh, naming things can be very repetitive and um, just difficult to find names. I have other methods as well, which I'll talk about, I guess, in another video. But she's having a good time because we find out she's locked away in an apartment. She's alone. She's, she's being hidden, right? Uh, and so she was having a little bit of fun, you know, giving these guys, you know, a, a look at her um, in, in the club. And they have a conversation about that. And finally, a cab sprays water. I, I just I was trying to convey the idea of these these soaked, hazy, you know, rain drenched streets that we see in Blade Runner. Neon lights everywhere. Hopefully I conveyed that atmosphere. That was my goal. And she's winning him back. She's calming him down. But then all of a sudden, all of these guys come, right? A voice behind her. This is where I am sort of echoing or mirroring back exactly the first lines of dialogue that you see in the story. So I think that's a good technique to, um, I don't know, it, it's it, it's like a match cut or something in a way, right? Where uh, in a film, you have a sequence of events and then later on in the film or a different part, you're sort of mirroring that to a degree for emphasis, right? Or to create a, a visual rhythm, you know? And that's what I try to do in writing. I, I try to write as visual as I can, as cinematic as I can. Not overly descriptive because I think that can be uh, misconstrued in that way. I, I, I met this one guy in a, in a comment where he said he writes very cinematically. And I started reading his his book and it was, yeah, I would, I would say it's pretty cinematic, but it's also overly detailed and so i try to that's one thing I've, I've really learned and really try to do is strip back so much detail in my writing because most of the time it's not really necessary um it's it's all about an economy of words and that's why again these are great exercises for me if you're not trying short stories highly recommend it because you'll find yourself when you're writing a novel that you can just go on and on and on and on and on and it doesn't matter right because there's technically no word count limit. And so when you're trying to hit a, an arbitrary word count, it, it definitely forces you to go back and cut stuff out. And in fact, even sometimes I'll, I'll go back and cut out even a lot more and then have to add some more uh, because even even I wrote too bloated in a thousand words. But they're talking about surprising because I surprising them because I guess it's an anniversary or something. Uh, you know, after all, it's your and we don't really find out. But then the man trips, falls into her, pushes her into the front of this cab and she falls, right? She falls into the high beams or right in front of a cab and gets killed, presumably, because now she is on a surgical table and uh, the tubes uh, tubes are coming out of her chest. So he's, this is where I'm starting to, uh, again, re uh, reemphasize the fact that uh, she is real because the tubes Leon had feigned to attach to her not, to not alert the room full of men who were his friends who would turn him in if they knew, if they knew she was real because it must be a crime. Maybe nobody knows that there are any more uh, real women whatsoever. And so that's a, it's a big, big deal. I mean, I guess it is, right? If it's the last woman on earth. Again, I'm just starting to tease that out a little bit. The the, where the air was heavy with, again, scent of plastic and condolences. Um, I'm not sure if I should change that to something else. I think that's a great opportunity for meaning. And like I said, the scent of plastic is coming from the um, the uh, the background, the curtain, the meat locker curtains, and, and presumably some other things that are very synthetic in this scene. I get a very plasticky sense when I look at this scene. But um, they're talking about, and this is when I, f I flat out say it, you know, uh, the, 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 the room full of men treated this like any other Android repair job. They argued about parts and procedures that would not save the last woman on earth while Leon held her cold hand. I wanted to save that to the end and I, I thought it would be a good idea just to plainly put it out there, put the title out there, just to hammer in the fact that if you did not get it yet, if you did not know that she was real and all these other women you see at the club or, you know, with the guys anyway, are fake, are androids. Hopefully that did it. But yeah, that was a fun story for me. Um, I got to play with a couple of other techniques. I got to write a little bit of noirish. I don't think it was carried through the entire thing, but there were some definite uh, passages in there that I was channeling that kind of writing. And that's another type of writing I feel like I 
I need to read more of like Raymond Chandler and, and stuff like that because it's it's a it's a writing style I really respect. It's very atmospheric. I love writing atmospheric, and I've been thinking about writing a sci-fi kind of almost a Blade Runnery um, detective sort of series of novels like pulpish, and I think that would be a good start at least to understand the genre a little bit more. Not that I'm going to try to copy it exactly, but just to be inspired by it. But things I learned here, well, um, like I said, uh, things about uh, repetition, cinematics, uh, taking a bit and having it mirrored toward another part of the novel. It's especially effective in short stories. It's especially effective in scenes, right? If you if you have it too far apart, uh, the reader may forget it, right? It's easier to do so in a movie because movies are so short. Movies are visual. Um, we're just going to store those images in our brain. Uh, sometimes we recognize it, sometimes we don't. Sometimes it takes subsequent viewings on a film to pick those things out. But with books, they take far, far longer to get through. And so I think it's uh, it probably serves better to um, do something that is uh, in a shorter span, right? A, a scene, a chapter. Um, I think if you have something really, really um, clear, you, you could have it echoed a few times throughout a novel to, to hopefully emphasize that so the reader gets it. And also I played with, you know, holding back a mystery, right? To keep the true knowledge hidden from the reader until the very last moment. It's a challenge. It's something that I, I try to practice because uh, when I read books, I don't want to know everything. I, I can't stand knowing everything. And some writers write like that. Even we're reading a book right now in our book club of uh, Gardens of the Moon. And um, with the exception of very, very few bits, uh, everything is laid out on the table. Now, we don't always know the master plot, but we, we know like sort of the motivations of everybody, all these different POVs. And it just kind of kills the magic of, of fiction for me, of storytelling, really. But yes, there are always things to change in writing. I will probably go back and change this quite a bit, I'm sure, on the rewrite, but I'm going to let it sit for a while. So I hope you enjoyed the story. Let me know what you thought. Uh, let me know if you've tried any of these techniques or if you have any techniques that I have not mentioned that... I should try myself and keep reading, keep writing, and I will see you next week. Thanks. Bye. If you'd like to read the story in its non-video format, check the link in the description. I didn't edit anything else. Promise. Thanks again.